Dating Sims. There's a kind of game not really especially understood or appreciated by the English-speaking world. While it has an eternal position as joke fodder, the genre itself is not especially alive and well these days, having more or less died at roughly the tail end of the PS2's lifespan. You don't see them much anymore, and especially not as tentpole AAA releases from major publishers. But for a time, specifically the late 90s, the genre was a genuine cultural phenomenon in Japan. And no dating sim was more iconic than Konami's Tokimeki Memorial, a series that rode high as one of Konami's defining franchises until it all came crashing to an abrupt halt, taking the entire surrounding genre with it, relegating it as the butt of lazy April Fool's jokes forevermore. So what happened? How did that happen? How did an entire genre up and die within the span of a console generation? This is a story of love, loss, and Tokimeki Memorial. So there's actually a lot of ground to cover here, and the first thing I've got to establish is what a dating simulator actually is as a genre, because odds are good we are not on the same page about this, but it is critical to our understanding going forward. I'm not going to get super in the weeds on it, because genre definitions are all semantics and where brain cells go to die, but the broad distinction I'm making is the difference between a romantic-themed visual novel where the story progresses in a linear fashion with maybe some branching choice options, and a dating simulator. Emphasis on simulator. Dating simulators are essentially offshoots of life simulation games, with naturally a focus on romance. Tokimeki Memorial, for instance, casts you in the role of someone entering their first year of high school. You take them through three years of high school life, raising your stats through various means, and the events of the game change reactively to that, like a mini-RPG. Genealogically speaking, this genre has roots closer to so-called raising games, like Princess Maker, than it does to the visual novel, even if the two genres often have similar styles of presentation. Not all of these games necessarily look like spreadsheets, though. Various games in the genre have different ideas about what it means to simulate. But as a general rule, dating sims are mechanically driven, visual novels are not. There's a lot of words that have been written attempting to define, say, the difference between a JRPG and a Western RPG, which is a debate I am absolutely not here to settle. But the most commonly accepted, if not incredibly precise, distinction is that JRPGs focus more on character-driven linear storytelling, while Western RPGs tend to emphasize player freedom and exploration. This is vibes-based, and I'm not presenting this as flawless, but it is quite a widely accepted idea. So if we accept that, Tokimeki Mamoru is perhaps best conceptualized as something like the Japanese equivalent of The Sims. The Sims allows almost complete freedom to create any kind of situation or narrative you so desire, while Tokimeki Memorial intends to tell a specific kind of story, a high school romance story, but you have quite a lot of agency in how that story plays out. This might all seem very pedantic to you, but this video is about Japanese games, and while in the West, dating sim is often used to describe a much broader spectrum of games, in Japan there's a much denser vocabulary used to describe these things, and I'm attempting to come at it from their angle, since obviously the romance-themed visual novel didn't stop existing, those are still trucking on completely unharmed. But this particular kind of dating sim this video is about, that sure did stop existing. So that's what we're talking about. Now that we're all hopefully closer to on the same page, let's begin the story of this series with its first entry. Tokimeki Memorial initially released for the PC Engine, better known to Americans as the TurboGrafx-16 in 1994. It was well regarded on the platform, but didn't immediately hit it big. Its notoriety as a quality game grew via word of mouth, and then in 1995, when the game was ported to the PlayStation under the name Tokimeki Memorial Forever With You, is when the game truly became a hit, selling over a million copies in a year on sale. That might not sound very impressive by today's metrics, but by the standards and size of the 90s Japanese video game market, that's a bona fide mega hit. When Tokimeki Memorial is discussed online, the PS1 version is almost certainly the version most people are going to be thinking of, so that's the version I'm using in the background footage. Let me give you a brief-ish overview of how playing Tokimemo actually works, both to attempt to explain the appeal and so we have vital mechanical context going forward. As I said, you take on the role of a high school freshman who you can name. You have just entered Kirameki High along with your childhood friend who you have slowly drifted apart from, Shiori Fujisaki, the most popular girl in the school setting you up with a romantic interest to pursue right out the gate. The prologue informs you of a local legend that a couple that confesses their love under a nearby tree of legend shall be happy together for eternity. You are then thrust at an inscrutable grid of icons and tacitly encouraged to press one. Tokimeki Memorial doesn't have a tutorial, you're meant to employ a combination of experimentation and reading the manual, which is fine, as we will see, but can initially be a bit much. These icons correspond to an activity you can make your character partake in, like studying literature or exercising, represented by these adorable little sprite animations. Your stats will go up according to what you pick, some others may decrease, 
Specific stat increases are also mildly random, with each individual day either being a success or a failure, which affects stat gain. Picking an activity commits you to that activity for a given week. This is the means by which you shape your character, and for the actual story, your story, to start taking place. Toki Memo lacks what I'd call much in the way of a main story, or even really individual character routes, in the sense that there is no fixed sequence of events that always takes place. What happens in the three in-game years that the game takes place over is entirely dependent on how you play and what girls you meet. While you start with Shiori in play, so to speak, her presence always made known to the player, as you develop your stats or join school clubs, you meet the other girls that comprise the game's cast, each with their own quirks and story to tell. How you get this story to play out is by, well, as you would expect from a dating sim, inviting them out on dates and progressively learning more about them. You know, kind of almost like how you get to know someone in real life if one was to touch grass instead of making senselessly long videos about Japanese dating sims. On dates, you will be given a dialogue prompt in response to whatever is currently happening. Pick the response the girl vibes with, she likes you more. Sometimes you get little mini-games representing aspects of school life, like the sports festival, where your performance is informed both by your ability to press buttons good, but also your stats. Do good at these, girls tend to like you more. Simple stuff. So far this probably sounds a little basic, but Toki Memo is in fact a video game with a difficulty curve and all that, so how does it mix this up? How does the game prevent you from just spending all your time with one character and relaxing? The answer, folks, is explosives. When you ignore a girl for too long, or are just forwardly dismissive of her, rumours about you start to spread. Visualise as a bomb next to a girl on this little chart you can view to keep track of how all the girls feel about you. Uh, notably, viewing this chart requires you to phone your sole male friend, which consumes an entire day of in-game time, so there is an opportunity cost associated with even checking this to confirm. You could use that day to phone a girl and plan a date after all, or simply spend that Sunday sleeping in to recover stamina and stress, which are also things you have to concern yourself with. I used to find it really silly that using the phone consumed an entire day, but now that I'm nearly 30 and the pandemic eroded all of my social skills, I totally get wanting to go to bed immediately after making one phone call. If you continue to ignore a bomb, or are continually rude to the girl harboring one, it will explode, harming your reputation with all girls. This isn't an immediate fail state, but it does set you back, and it can cause a kind of cascading failure where bombs set off other bombs, causing your romantic stocks to plummet. And yes, if you were wondering why Konami includes Fujisaki as a character in the Bomberman games, this is why. Now you know! A f fucking motorbike just drove past my house when I was recording. I hope that didn't pick up on Mike. <coughs> Dispensing with bombs is done by satisfying the girl that you're not actually a jerk. Taking them on a nice date or giving them a good birthday present are the two main ways to accomplish this. Straightforward enough when said out loud, but the compounding complexity of this system is the beating heart of Tokimeki Memorial, not romance. It's simple to explain, but tricky to fully keep on top of. As the game goes on and your stats improve, you will inevitably meet more girls. More girls means more plates you have to keep spinning, as all girls are prone to bombing if kept at arm's length for too long. I'll not analyse the societal implications of that last sentence too strongly, because as a mechanic it's fun to play with and keeps the game moving. By the end of the game, you end up in a hectic rush trying to keep about a dozen characters happy with you so the bombs don't cascade and kill your shot with the girl you're actually trying to get with by the end. The greatest sleight of hand of Tokimeki Memorial is that while it builds itself as a dating simulator, it is actually a strategy game. A surprisingly complex strategic game emerges as a result of these simple systems that lends itself to a pretty varied set of possible playstyles across multiple runs, particularly as you replay to see different routes and gear your character towards specific girls. If you're trying to woo a sporty girl, for instance, academic stats are of little importance to you, as she doesn't value them, and cultivating them will only result in the more bookish girls introducing themselves, which gives you additional difficulties. But oh no, you neglected your studies entirely too hard, causing you to completely fail your midterms, which forces you to take remedial classes, which in turn forces you to miss mandatory sports club practice, getting you kicked out of the club altogether, ruining your game plan for the run. So you still can't afford to play in a thoughtless way, you need to cultivate enough academics to not flunk entirely while still keeping them under control enough to not accidentally catch the eye of a girl who corresponds to those stats. Since if you have a specific route already in mind, adding additional characters usually just complicates the playthrough. That is simply one possible experience, there are dozens of ways this can play out, and over a dozen characters each with their own preferences and complications on how you end up needing to play the game to successfully see their ending. Tokimeki Memorial stands strong as a really well-executed and interesting example of how to craft the entire gameplay loop of something very much like an RPG out of something that doesn't involve combat in any way. I mean, okay, there is this bit, but this is like, a joke event. The strategic elements of Toki Memo are robust and engaging enough that there has long been an entire speedrunning community dedicated to reaching those endings as fast as possible. Wait, he's blindfolded. 
How the hell is he doing that? Speaking of the ending, at the end of the three high school years, you will see the ending if you have successfully gained the affection of a lady and your stats meet their expectations. You'll be granted the final scene of her confessing her love under the Tree of Legend, cementing your eternal happiness. Aww. So that's Tokimeki Memorial 1 in a nutshell. There's plenty more to delve into, a lot of mechanical quibbles I didn't go over, nor much of the specifics of its cast, but someone else can make that six hour of it. Oh, someone already did that? Aw, oh, man. Regardless, the appeal of the game lies in its charming characters, light-hearted, often comedic tone, breezy to grasp but engaging core gameplay loop, and a certain hard-to-articulate appeal of getting to participate in what is essentially a slice-of-life anime where your choices impact the narrative. That probably sounds kind of dorky, but I'm the one making a long-ass video about dating sims. I did not come here to pretend I am not cringe. I am here to engage sincerely today. I've often heard from commentators that Tokimemo appeals to a specific cultural quirk of Japan, that of the appeal of getting to relive high school, the last time many felt truly free, or so they say. And I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong per se, I just don't think it's unique to Japan is all. The appeal of a game like Tokimemo is not some culturally impenetrable wall that Westerners can't get their heads around. We also put a weird amount of nostalgia value on our high school years. Tokimemo's particulars are very much rooted in Japanese culture, but if you're actually willing to engage with the work on its own terms, there is plenty to like. It's a great game and one of the classics of its era. The Japanese public certainly agreed. Like I said earlier, the game was a hit, becoming a million seller rapidly. Konami, being quick to recognize they had a good thing on their hands, ported the game to everything they could, getting Saturn, PC, and Super Nintendo versions out the door. Yeah, a Super Nintendo version. This game was released on the PS1 and then backported to the Super Nintendo after the fact. A thing I have literally no other examples of happening ever, so that's a novelty. Incidentally, this Super Nintendo version is at the time of writing the only version of the game with a completed English fan translation, which while not ideal since this version obviously has a lot of bells and whistles of the PS1 version, like the artwork and voice acting, either downgraded or removed entirely, but it's not as bad as I'd heard. I played it for this video and was surprised to find rumors of its inferiority hugely exaggerated. It is a downgraded port, and it certainly takes a hit to the charm from the lack of voice acting primarily, but the basic gameplay loop is as solid as ever, and content-wise there are surprisingly very few omissions. This is a complete Tokimeki Memorial experience, and while not the most famous version, there is no reason you can't come to understand the appeal of the game through it. No, sadly, what's most likely to keep English speakers off really getting it in this case is the translation itself, and that's really mean to say, I know. Fan translations are difficult and time-consuming to produce, and I'm not really saying I could have done a better job myself. I'm a crap translator, I just don't have the experience writing characters or dialogue that you really need for it, nor am I a completely fluent reader of Japanese in the first place. I make do, obviously, hence this channel's output, but I digress. Uh, point is, this, the only available fan translation, is littered with awkward, stilted, redundant, and overly literal dialogue that deals critical damage to the charm of the game, and that's not a trivial problem given it lives and dies on its character writing. It's functional, this isn't a problem of misunderstanding the source material or anything, it's mostly just problems of style. Like example time, one of the more bizarre style choices is when Asahina is introduced, the English patch attempts to use this red coloured text to indicate a laboured tone of voice in lieu of any attempt to make the dialogue sound punchier. The Japanese version never uses coloured text, this is an invention of the ROM hacker and it's a really weird attempt at a workaround for weak dialogue. It's not great, but I'm not going to labour this point any further because, again, it's kind of mean and rude and I feel bad about including this aside at all, but I'd feel worse uncritically recommending non-Japanese speakers to jump into the patch without this caveat. If you're going to venture a trip to the English patch after watching this video because I convinced you it was worth a try, be prepared to do some mental correction and cut the game some slack if the characters come off as kind of flat and the dialogue sometimes awkward. I promise you there's a reason many people fell in love with this game's cast originally. And many did indeed fall in love with the cast, with particular attention towards its main heroine, Shiori Fujisaki. To the point where a whole awkwardly rotoscoped music video was made for her character theme titled Oshiete Mr. Sky. This was aired on television! I could not tell you what the earliest example of an animated character as musical act was, but this was way out in front. All of this is to say that Tokimeki Memorial was a sensation, and its phenomenal success sparked a huge boom in the dating sim genre. It was not the first dating sim, to be clear, it's predated somewhat by a handful of other games with varying claims to genre originator status. But Tokimemo was definitely the genre popularizer, and by god did it popularize. In an instant everyone was getting new dating sims out, left and right, many considered very good in their own right. This was the golden age of dating sims, with releases like Enterbrain's True Love Story series, the Noel games and the Yarudora games, to name a few. Each hits in their own right, selling over 100,000 units. Great numbers for the day. 
Also of note is that parallel to the release of the original Tokimeki Memorial, Koei series Angelique would soon hit the scene, a game where you take the role of a fair maiden trying to win the hearts of pretty boys, ushering in the otome game genre with a dating sim aimed at women. Every demographic was getting in on it, dating sims were just popping up all over the place. Konami even took another crack at it themselves with Mitsumete Night, a game that transplants the Tokimemo formula to a fantasy European setting, complete with more recognisably RPG type elements like an actual combat system. This game is also really quite good and probably deserves a video in its own right, but the real second main tentpole dating sim at this time was actually Sega's Sakura Wars, which mashed up the dating sim formula with a strategy RPG and saw immense success in Japan for it. It too was never translated officially, which is a shame because it was so clearly ahead of its time. Years later, the West would go crazy for a certain series that mashes up the dating sim formula with a more traditional JRPG, proving that formula had legs outside Japan, but it was too little too late for the pure form of the genre. But as for Tokimeki Memorial itself, no true successor emerged. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Konami didn't milk the shit out of their cash cow, because they absolutely did, cranking out a ton of spin-off games and merchandise. Of these spin-offs, I'd like to briefly highlight two for no reason other than that I think they're interesting. First is the series of drama games, technically a series of three games. These are not in fact dating sims, but linear adventure games, more in line with what a Western audience would likely call a visual novel, that explore the characters with greater depth and nuance, and are well liked amongst Japanese fans for their storytelling. But the immediately striking thing about them is that they were actually made by the team that would later become Kojima Productions inside Konami, and indeed the big man himself, Hideo Kojima, worked on all three. You can tell, because all of these games basically borrow their structure from Police Noughts. And you know, I get why fans of Kojima's work are more interested in Police Noughts than the Love Story games, because Police Noughts definitely features more of Kojima's authorial voice in it, while the Tokimemo drama games had more of a brand to stick to, and Kojima was not a writer on any of them, he was a producer. Which is a shame, because I'd love to play a dating sim written by him, it'd be the most insane game ever made. But regardless, spare a thought for these games when you consider Kojima's career as a game designer, because despite their positive reputation, they tend to get completely left out of Western perspectives on the guy. Somewhat understandably. And the second interesting spin-off is Tokimeki Memorial Oshiete Your Heart, an arcade adaptation of Tokimeki Memorial, which excises almost all aspects of the game besides the dating segments, but makes the completely batshit inclusion of a mouse-shaped sensor on the cabinet that you put your hand on, and it measures your heart rate and sweat level. Yes, really. Wow. <laughs> It does this in order to determine how your responses go over. As in, if you say something excitable but your heart rate and sweat levels are low, the girls might read your response as a joke or otherwise insincere, which may be good or bad depending on the context. Apparently this led to players doing all kinds of stupid shit to gain the sensor reactions, like doing squats near the machine to get their blood pumping, or conversely squeezing their wrist to halt blood flow while the machine read their pulse. If the fact this game was popular enough to receive a port to the arcade with weird, unique, bespoke hardware gimmicks doesn't convey just how popular it was at its peak, then I don't know what will. But while spin-offs are all well and good, where was the actual Tokimeki Memorial 2? The dating sim boom had fully spun up, and a sequel seemed like nothing but a sure thing commercially, but years passed and nothing materialised. For a point of comparison, in the time after Tokimeki Memorial 1 launched, Enterbrain managed to get not two, not three, but four games in the True Love Story series out fully capitalizing on the popularity that Tokimemo helped to establish. But, eventually, Tokimeki Memorial 2 would launch on November 25th, 1999, a mere handful of months before the PlayStation 2. Nowadays, five-year gaps between main installments in major franchises is a norm, but back on the PS1 days it was completely unheard of because that was the span of an entire console generation. So what the hell were they doing all this time? How did it turn out? Well, if you've been following along, you might have an idea where this is going. But you'd be wrong, because Tokimeki Memorial 2 is a masterpiece. That's right, we're still on the uphill for now. Tokimeki Memorial 2 is a staggeringly huge game that puts its hitherto unprecedented four-year development time on full display, coming with five discs packed in to accommodate its sheer scope, making it the largest PS1 game by file size on the entire platform. I think. I did try to double check that, Riven also came on five discs, but I'm pretty sure Tokimemo 2 wins out in terms of storage. Whatever. Now, Tokimeki Memorial 2 is not structurally incredibly different from its predecessor, you still play out a high school life by selecting activities and cultivating your stats accordingly, but Tokimemo 2 seeks to expand basically every aspect of the simulation. 
More events, more minigames, more nuanced character storytelling. The entire first disc is spent playing through a surprisingly lengthy prologue where you take control of your protagonist as an elementary schooler in this isometric 3D semi-open world segment, a gameplay style that never returns afterwards, largely just to set the stage for the characters. They made basically an entire separate kind of game just for the prologue because Tokimeki Memorial 2 could do whatever the hell it wanted. The general system itself is similar, but lots of small tweaks make it feel substantially richer. Individual characters now have stat lines of their own that affect their own life and things like exam performance. When you get to the stage of friendliness where girls begin to hang out with you during activities, you end up becoming a sizable influence on their stat line, and this can very much be for better or worse. It introduces the concept of romantic rivals in the form of your two male friends, Jun and Takumi. You had a male friend in the first game too, but Yoshio was not really a character, he was more of a gameplay device. You called him to get the current state of how girls feel about you, and he did not do much else besides that. A bro to be sure, but mostly a bro of mechanical convenience. Takumi in 2 still performs the information function, but these two are also playing their own concurrent game of Toki Memo alongside you, the player, and their attempts to woo their classmates can intersect your own, again for better or worse. An addition made that is pure indulgence is the emotional voice system, EVS for short. This allows you to punch in your name and the game will generate a corresponding voice sample from the voice bank to have the characters in the game actually speak your name to you instead of the usual awkward pause where the player name would go. Even going so far as allowing you to specify a pitch accent pattern to get the read just right. An example of Konami going to considerable lengths to solve this really minor break in immersion. It comes at a cost though. The cost is your entire memory card. It takes 11 blocks on a PS1 memory card, which is almost the entire card by itself. This feature is optional, thankfully, but still, damn. Additionally, the base game only allows you to generate samples for two of the game's 13 girls. The others were only available via additional discs distributed with a magazine. If you add these extra three discs, Toki Memo 2's total storage becomes closer to 4 gigabytes spread across eight discs. Ridiculous. Bombs have also been reworked to be less of a calamity. In the first game, bombs detonating tanked your relationship with all girls equally, but in two, they're more sensitive to the interpersonal relationships between the cast. Leading girl Hikari cares very much about the opinion of her best friend Kotoko, and vice versa. When these two bomb, they will tank each other's opinion very sharply, while aloof loner doesn't have many friends Yae doesn't really give that much of a crap about almost anyone else's opinion, being largely insensitive to bombs from the vast majority of the cast. And notably, the system isn't symmetrical. Yae's bombs affect others to a mild extent despite her relative insensitivity to them. It's neat. It's also clear that in the four years between 1 and 2, the team had a lot of ideas for how to leverage these system mechanics for more interesting storytelling. For instance, Kaidako is introduced as the manager of the baseball team and can be, and very often is, met early on in the game. So you spend about two discs of the game getting to know her, and then about a third of the way through the game, she transfers to a different school and she's just gone. She's just gone. It happens very suddenly, Kaidako doesn't tell you until about a week before it's going to because she feels bad about it. And past that point, the most you can really do is give her a phone call every now and again and maybe meet up at into high baseball matches. It's jarring in a good way. It leverages the mechanics of the game to create a unique storytelling mechanism. I am cringe enough to admit the first time I went through this route, the suddenness of this actually kind of hurt my feelings. Like, what do you mean she's just gone? That's not how this works. For some contrasting levity, there's a different girl whose route gimmick is that she's basically a boss rush because Tokimeki Memorial 2 has an entire faux JRPG combat system in it, because back in those days when a game was developed for four years, they just did whatever the hell they wanted, and I don't even have time to get into what the hell's going on here. I'd feel bad about spoiling some of these choicer moments, but the game is over 20 years old and has no English translation, I think I'm good to just cut to the chase. These tweaks and expansions of the system mechanics do a lot to make the simulation feel more immersive and make the characters feel like they are in fact people with inner worlds and thoughts and stuff and not simply pieces of a video game. Which goes well with the fact that while this is all great in its own way, the main thing Tokimeki Memorial 2 does vastly, overwhelmingly better than its predecessor is character writing. I appreciate this is kind of hard to demonstrate in a video like this, the genre doesn't exactly lend itself to amazing sizzle reels. But Tokimeki Memorial 2's characters are just substantially more interesting and well-developed than its predecessor, to the point where it actually made it hard to go back to the original when recording the footage for this video. A lot goes into this, the greater disc space allows for more events, and lengthier ones too, giving more breathing room to the cast, but it also displays a surprisingly adept ability to juggle tone. Tokimeki Memorial 2 is largely still a light-hearted, feel-good kind of game, but it balances comedy, sincerity, and occasional moments of seriousness really well. 
It's an endearing game, especially the lead, Hikari. She's fantastic. She's a little cheeky, a little selfish, but extremely likeable and ultimately winds up as probably this entire series' strongest character. She exists as a kind of reply to Shiori. They both similarly occupy the role of childhood friend character, but Shiori was notably and to point of almost mimetic status in Japan, kind of cold towards the player at the outset. <laughs> Shiori, we are neighbours, what the fuck are you talking about? Hikari distinguishes herself by actually treating the protagonist as you would if you had known and ostensibly been friends with them for years prior. It's refreshing and interesting, both mechanically and narratively, to start the game in a place where one of the girls more or less already likes you. It's a bit of a struggle to convey what makes this work in a video like this because it's all in the details, the little quirks of each conversation, the little shifts in demeanour that occur over the course of a route, it's all sublimely executed. Hikari's great, they did a fantastic job with this character. And again, Japanese players agreed en masse as she regularly topped the popularity polls. In general, Tokimemo 2 is fantastic. Understand that I say this full in the knowledge of how stacked the console's library is, but Tokimemo 2 is genuinely one of the best games on the PS1, and only its status as untranslated keeps it from the recognition it truly deserves. I would go as far as to say, and this might be a controversial opinion, I don't really know, there isn't much of a fandom for dating sims in the English-speaking world, that Tokimemo 2 is just the singular best game in its genre. I haven't played a better one. Now, despite players and the press of the time being roughly as enthusiastic as I was about it, Tokimemo 2 did not sell as well as one did. This likely had little to do with quality, as I've gone to great pains to impress, but more to do with timing. Tokimeki Memorial 1 created a boom in demand for the genre, and had its sequel released a year or even two after it, likely would have been a hit of seismic proportions but by coming out at the tail end of the PS1's life, it largely missed out on the market boom that it had itself created. This is not to say that Tokimemo 2 sold badly, it enjoyed sales that were strong enough to be considered a great success, but it did not go supernova like one did, so to speak. The dating sim market was in something of a decline after the huge boom in popularity it experienced after Tokimemo 1, but this could be seen as relatively normal. There was a surge of interest, and then it leveled out somewhat by the time 2 released. Nothing about this necessarily precipitates the more or less complete genre extinction that would end up happening, but we'll get there soon enough. Notably, 2 was not ported to anything besides the PS1, and it took 10 years to even get a reissue of it made available through the PlayStation Network. A game that, while not exactly an unfortunate child by any means, was certainly a victim of timing. But it was nowhere near as much a victim of timing as what would happen next. The year is now 2000. The PlayStation 2 has been released, and Konami does something pretty out there, at least for its day. They open a crowdfunding campaign. Now, crowdfunding video games is super common nowadays, but it was virtually unheard of in the 2000s, let alone from a powerhouse like Konami. But, sure enough, Konami opened what they would call the Tokimeki Game Fund, a campaign to gather the funds to produce two games, Tokimeki Memorial 3 and a spin-off Tokimemo aimed at girls, called Girlside. This was such a sensationally out there move for the time that it even broke surface in the English speaking world despite not being accessible or even really that relevant to non-Japanese people. I was able to find contemporary articles from both GameSpot and the New York Times covering the campaign. Now, this was not like the kinds of crowdfunding campaigns we see nowadays, this was not a Kickstarter. This was a real honest to god investment trust developed by a financial security company registered in Bermuda for tax reasons. People who bought into the fund became real investors who stood to gain money if the games performed well, with a minimum buy-in of 100,000 yen, roughly a thousand US dollars at the time. Boy, if that wasn't a depressing thing to write. Also, unlike a Kickstarter where the only thing you risk is your initial payment up front, this was a real investment trust, so participants were exposed to financial risk in the event the games underperformed. But more similarly to a Kickstarter, perks were offered for higher amounts invested, like names in the game's credits or receiving a special investor edition version of the game. What isn't super clear to me, a future person who cannot perfectly view things through the lens of late 90s, early 2000s Japan due to not being Japanese, is why Konami wanted to attempt this kind of bold approach to funding a video game in the first place. Konami wasn't exactly a small player in the industry, after all. My best guess is that it had something to do with the overall economic downturn that Japan was experiencing at the time, the so-called lost decade. I'm not going to get super in the weeds on that, because frankly I've been living in an economic recession pretty much since I was born, so whatever Japan, you're not special. Jokes aside, the problems began here almost immediately. Konami sought to raise 1.2 billion yen via the fund, but only 770 million yen actually managed to materialise, forcing the two games to be developed on little over half the expected budget. Additionally, Tokimeki Memorial 3 was targeting the PlayStation 2, which was new and unfamiliar hardware to the team. 
The console generation gap could be unkind at the best of times, but as we will see, it hit Tokimemo 3 particularly hard. Ultimately, Tokimeki Memorial 3 floundered at retail, only selling about 150,000 units, resulting in a huge loss for Konami and everyone who placed their faith in the company by investing in the fund. What's more, it was a failure that reverberated so strongly the entire genre of dating sim in general never recovered after this. Tokimemo itself would go dormant, and there would only be a handful of other games of this type released on the PS2 before the genre would ultimately fizzle out of consoles entirely. Konami never tried this funding strategy ever again. So the question now is obvious. Why? Why did the game bomb? Well, not to bury the lead, but it's because the game is bad. If you've made it this far into the video, congratulations, you've gotten to the fun part where we get to dunk on a game that sucks. Tokimeki Memorial 3 released in December 2001, just slightly over two years after its predecessor. Not an unheard of amount of time for releases in those days, but compared to the four years that Tokimemo 2 spent in the oven, didn't set the game up for flattering comparisons. Nevertheless, Konami did set out to treat this thing like the premium release it was, producing real gaudy collector's editions that come in huge pink boxes, roughly the size of my entire torso. Fortunately, due to 3 being a bomb at retail, I was able to get one of these for like 30 bucks, a decision I do not regret in the slightest. Before I jump in, I'd like to thank my friend Will, you can find him at Twitter at Altagonio for helping with the production of this video. He helped with organising the writing and translations, but he also massively helped this segment of the video by recording his own playthrough alongside mine, and sent me the footage, which was very nice of him. He posts about Japanese games, and if you've made it this far into the video, I assume you're into that sort of thing, so maybe check out his writing. Okay, back to it. Pop the disc in, and you are greeted by a disembodied voiceover explaining the game's framework to you. 3 doesn't have any in-game way of explaining this to you for some reason, so it opts for this instead. It's basically the same setup as the first game, except you are attending Moigano High School instead of Kirimeki High, and instead of a legendary tree that confers eternal happiness to those who confess their love under it, it's a legendary hill instead. Then the opening theme song plays, and things start to go wrong almost immediately. Tokimemo 3 wanted to innovate and flex some new graphics tech, and consequently went for full 3D models for all of its characters instead of the 2D sprites of previous games, and they're... quite rough, aren't they? Bear in mind this is the opening, which has been specifically curated to try and make the game look as good as possible, and it still looks pretty off. It looks especially bad from the side, which makes every character look like they have a very pointy nose. This problem is especially visible in the game's key art, which again is specifically curated to try and make the game look good, but makes it all the more clear that every character looks identical, and only seems to meaningfully differ in terms of hair colour and style. It might seem silly to harp on graphics at all, but these games are, to a much greater extent than most other kinds of game, really reliant on having a charming cast, and it's a bit difficult to buy into that when they all look the same. But okay, let's actually start playing the game. The emotional voice system is back, and to spare a nice word for the game at the outset, I think it's much better implemented in this game. The voice synth is more natural, and it doesn't require three discs to create voices for all the characters. You can even set a form of address on a per-character basis. It still eats a huge amount of memory card space, which makes this impractical to actually do, but if you're willing to dedicate an entire memory card to it, it would work. The game's actual intro is both very banal and profoundly meaningful, as the protagonist sets out on his first day of high school, but taking a sentimental detour to the aforementioned Legendary Hill, which you, the player, already know about because of the disembodied VO, and you, the viewer, already know about because of my disembodied VO. When you get there, a cartoonish amount of cherry blossoms swirl around you, and you meet... a girl. Behold. Woman. We then immediately smash cut to class, with our protagonist apparently having not even attempted to say a word to the girl we just met, so I am forced to conclude we just stared at her for a few minutes before spinning around and leaving. A second girl, Yukiko Makihara, introduces herself as having gone to the same elementary and middle school as us. The protagonist doesn't recognise her literally at all and is casually dismissive towards her as a result, internally saying she didn't leave much of an impression. Compared to the first game, where the protagonist is openly into Shiori at the outset as a means of giving you a goal to work towards, and especially compared to 2 where they tried really hard to make the friendship between the protagonist and Hikari evident and believably warm, the protagonist's complete lack of enthusiasm towards Yukiko is both really goddamn mean and kind of frustrating from a narrative standpoint. If the game itself can't feign interest in its characters, why should I? 
We then meet our first romantic rival, Yabe, inquiring about our relationship with Yukiko. When we tell Yabe we don't know much, he calls us useless. And then our second rival, Shiratori, shows up pretty much just to say that we suck and he's so much better with the ladies who will all immediately fall for his charms. These two suck ass and make a terrible impression that never dissipates as the game goes on, with them being largely nothing but rude and unpersonable the entire game. Furthermore, they barely interact with the game mechanically, so they're not even fun to engage with as part of the challenge. Again, this makes an unflattering comparison with the rivals from the second game, with whom you not only have a more natural relationship, they're just much more likeable as characters. Takumi is kind of sleazy, but he's not actively hostile to you. And Jun has his own little plotline playing out over the game, and it's rewarding to see it through to its conclusion by playing Wingman for him, adding an extra layer to that game. So, zero for three so far on initial character introductions for Toki Memo 3. Rounding out this shit show of an opening, we bump into the girl we met on the hill at the start of the game, and our protagonist flags her down and very awkwardly asks for her name, because, you know, we saw her on that hill and didn't ask. The girl, rightfully, thinks this is incredibly weird and that we are incredibly weird, but nevertheless obliges. Her name is Rika Kawai, which, yes, is homophonic with cute science in Japanese, which is a little on the nose, but whatever. She then makes her excuses and gets the hell away from us, the weird guy who has randomly decided we must know a girl's name because we saw her on a hill. Meeting her in general will turn out to be a huge mistake for this playthrough. This is the first 10 minutes of this game, and absolutely every character introduction has either been mean, actively hostile, or plainly awkward. This is an early tone setter and one of the main problems of Toki Memo 3 at large. Character interactions are just so goddamn weird. Everyone is mean all the time for seemingly no reason, and characters intermittently engage in completely bizarre behaviour not consistent with any previous characterization or any kind of basic common sense. As an aside, if my use of the girl in that last character introduction seems strange to you, that's because that's simply how that interaction shook out on my run. You see, the character you meet on the hill at the start of the game is completely random, it can be any of the game's core cast of girls. The ensuing interaction where you ask for her name is pretty similar across the cast, it's always awkward and weird. But note that this too is an early warning sign for a pervasive issue with 3. A lot of things, like meeting characters which were largely dictated by player decision making in the previous games, are now in the hands of a random number generator. I assume the goal with this particular decision was so the game always starts with two girls in play at the start instead of just the one, except you can also meet Makihara on the hill, at which point there's no meaning to it, so actually I have no idea what the point of this is. So, amazing intro, really getting off on the right foot here, so I go to save the game and realize my memory card only has space for one save file. Ugh. Okay, back to it. Let's talk mechanics. The basic loop hasn't changed a huge amount. It's still largely a game of picking an activity to cultivate a given stat, but Tokyo Memo 3 has compressed the majority of the stat management down into four parameters. Humanities, Logic, Art, and Athletics, and has replaced being shown a number with instead a level and an experience bar. The change to how the values work isn't really anything too crazy, but the reduction in the number of attributes is kind of disappointing, since it reduces the options you have for shaping your character and it makes the game easier overall since there's just less stats to manage. Furthermore, when doing an activity, there's a random chance of a success or failure. All the games are like this. But three in specific, a failure grants you absolutely no experience at all. In the previous games, a failure still granted some stat growth just at a lower rate. The intention behind this isn't really to hinder the player. It's to lightly randomize the rate at which stats grew so you couldn't simply complete the game by following a script beat for beat. Whereas in 3, a failure is worth absolutely squat, so if you spend an in-game week failing every single day, which will happen sometimes, that week is just completely wasted, you get nothing out of it. In theory, this serves the same function of randomizing playthroughs, but in practice it feels really frustrating to get absolutely nothing out of an in-game week. Time is your most limited resource in these games, after all. But helpfully, Tokyo Memo 3 relaxes the restriction on saving, allowing you to save and load at any time, whereas in the previous games it was restricted to Sundays only, in an effort to discourage save scumming. Or so you think. Because if you actually try to save and load, you'll pretty quickly notice that if you attempt the same activity, you get the same result. The only way to get a different result is to pick a different activity entirely. The random number generator is seeded ahead of time instead of on each action selection, so this doesn't really end up helping that much. And if anything is likely to make you waste your time as it did mine by reloading a handful of times before noticing it's not actually doing anything. Understandable, but annoying. And final change to the base layer of mechanics, when you join a club, participating in that club as your weekly activity accrues club experience, which is now a visible stat you can track in the bottom right. This was a hidden parameter in the previous games, now it isn't. This change is fine, doesn't make a huge difference. 
In this playthrough, I joined the Track and Field Club because Yukiko joins it as the manager and I decided to go for her on this run. Sports Club have intermittent practice matches against other high schools, success at which is determined via a composite of your athletic stat and club experience, and it's nice to have club experience visible to keep better track of that, rather than having to just feel it out. Now, it's when we get to the weekend that the new stuff starts rolling in. Weekends give access to a completely different set of activities now. You can prepare for classes the following week for a boost to efficiency, gone is the ability to just study on weekends directly, mostly for balance reasons I assume because one of the funnier things to ever cause a design shift in a video game has to do with changes to the Japanese education system itself. In previous games, Sunday was your only day off school, so it was the only day of the week you could phone a girl to make a date plan or spend it on an activity for an even greater stat gain than normal. But as of 2001 and Tokyo Memo 3's release, Japanese schools stopped having school on Saturdays, so they had to change how this element of the game worked in order to both maintain fidelity to reality and also the game's balance, and I'm kind of mixed on how they went about it. Regardless, I'd like to front changes in educational policy as an all-time funny reason for a game to completely change one of its design elements. So the major thing they opted to fill all this newfound free time the youngsters have was the hobby system. I do love the implication that due to the six-day school week there was no time for hobbies in previous games. Life simulation games can be very revealing sometimes. Anyway, you open the hobby menu and are greeted with this absolute wall of options. Several pages of them encompassing things like reading books, gardening, knitting, cooking, and amateur archaeology. Okay, sure, men do love to dig holes, it's true. None of the hobbies have any kind of animations associated with them, just a progress bar and text, and it leaves you to imagine what it might look like, which is a little sad, but given the sheer amount of options, it's kind of understandable. There are pros and cons to this system. Pros is that it restores some of that player expression that was lost from compressing the stat management. You can make a bookworm, or a gamer, or a green thumb type of character. The con is primarily that the system is overwhelming. Hobbies individually have really inconsistent value to the player, and the whole thing is really opaque, requiring substantial time spent trial and erroring to figure out what all this crap even does. Options tend to explode out into even more options. You purchase gardening tools and the menu expands for you to grow like eight different kinds of flowers. You buy a video game catalogue and you get seven different genres of game to individually purchase because you can be a gamer inside of your dating sim. All in all, there's close to genuinely 100 options to filter through here, and it's just kind of a lot. Hobbies like cooking grant pretty ready access to useful items that lower stress and restore stamina strongly, to the point where you basically never need to use the rest command anymore. A thing you needed to manage in previous games or your character would become ill, it's an extremely strong hobby. Meanwhile, archaeology just surfaces largely pointless and ugly items like a rusty bell for you to decorate your room with. You can maybe use some of them as gifts, but overall it's only useful for people who like collecting weird knickknacks, but you're not really going to know which hobbies are useful and which ones are secretly pranks until you waste a lot of time on it. I'd say it just barely avoids being something you need a guide on hand to make sense of, but only just barely. It can be done, because I did, but boy was I just randomly doing stuff for about half the game before it started to click. Now, this has been a lot of mechanical stuff, but isn't this a dating sim? Where are the dates, Punchy? When do I get to go out with a girl? You can't rush love people. Or at least Tokyo Memo 3 certainly thinks so, given that the journey it makes you embark on to simply be able to go on dates, you know, the basic thing you're meant to be doing in this game, is absurdly roundabout. In previous games, scheduling a date was simple. You called a girl up on a Sunday or holiday and asked. If you didn't know a phone number, you called your male friend instead and he'd tell you the number. Pretty straightforward. It was kind of weird that he knows all the phone numbers, and I guess they sought to remedy that extremely inconsequential incongruity that kept the pace of the game moving by adding a dash of realism, but in doing so completely tanked the flow of the gameplay. Now, in order to get a date or get a phone number, you need to ask the girl in question. Logical yes, straightforward no. Nothing can ever be simple around here. Get a load of this. Step 1. Find the girl. Even though you all go to the same school, your first tribulation is, for some reason, locating the girl in question. Every time a stat levels up, you trigger an event. Usually this is the walking home from school event where you can choose to wait for a particular girl to show up. If she does, you can ask her to walk home with you. Every single step of this has a random chance of failing. The event can just as easily be replaced by one of the two male dorks telling you that you suck, and this just wastes an opportunity because screw you. The girl can also just fail to show up entirely, wasting the event. And even if she does show up, she can just reject your invitation to walk home, again, wasting the event. This is all completely luck-based, there's nothing you can meaningfully do to influence the outcome of these. I will say it again, 
These events occur on level up, which means the higher your level goes, the more spaced out and harder to come by these opportunities are. Put a pin in that, it'll matter later. It can take months in-game before you finally convince someone to walk home with you, and when you do, you're presented with a lethal choice. Do you schedule a date right now, or ask for her phone number? Choose wisely. You need phone numbers desperately to even play the game, because if you have a phone number, you can call a girl directly instead of having to play this walk from home school roulette horse shit. But asking for phone numbers again, like everything else in this process, has a pretty high chance of just failing outright, wasting a rare chance to get something going. It's a little safer to immediately attempt to schedule a date, but again, you can just get declined and even on the date you may not receive a phone number. There's just no guarantees here, and as a result, it can take a solid hour or two of this song and dance before you really get to actually play Toki Memo. It's absurd, it's such a pain. As I will impart to you later, there is a trick to navigating these weird systems that alleviates the frustration significantly, but unless you know these tricks, it is slow going at the outset. On the playthrough I recorded for this video, I was coming in with knowledge, and I was lucky. I was able to get this ball rolling relatively fast, and by relatively fast I mean it took 40 minutes before I was able to schedule my first date this way. That is fast by this game's standards. But the first time I played this game, I went two hours of gameplay getting no phone numbers and having my attempts rebuffed over a dozen times, meaning I got to do extremely little of the core gameplay. Not fun in the least. But okay, I have successfully scheduled a date with Rika. Shortly after, I am treated to an event where she drags us into a secluded room and measures our brain activity. This has nothing to do with the date and will not matter for several hours. You might think now that I have a date, I have surpassed the hurdles and can now begin playing Toki Memo as God intended. Absolutely not, you fool. You complete idiot. You unmatched poop face. The trials have merely just begun. The next Sunday rolls around for the date, so you click the option to head out and you are presented with outfit selection. This screen is the source of much agony and annoyance, but you wouldn't think so looking at it. It's a simple screen, you have a selection of shirts, pants and shoes, and some accessories like baseball caps with which to create a fit. You've got some options that are a bit much, like a business suit and dress shoes, but that's presumably for special occasions, you know, context and all that. I settle on a pretty normal looking outfit of this green polo shirt, blue jeans and trainers. I radiate normal dude energy right now. Here's how that goes. And that's your date wasted. Go back to the walk from home slot machine, dipshit. So, yes, if you show up to a date wearing an outfit your date considers sufficiently hideous, they will just wholesale walk out on you. This is a mechanic actually present in earlier games too, but there it's tied to the appearance style which you can see and thus keep track of. And the walkouts only occur if you critically neglect it. Here it occurs based on if the girl thinks your vibes are rancid. But as for why, I could not tell you. I have played this entire game through multiple times, and at no point was I able to make sense of anything going on here. I'm convinced the outfit system is broken in some way. At this juncture, I waste about 15 minutes of my life reloading a save before the date and changing my outfit to various combinations of shirts and pants, trying to find any outfit that won't elicit a disgusted reaction out of Rika, and I couldn't do it. I got bored of trying to figure it out and just settled on her making the same snide comment that my outfit sucks, but at least not choosing to just leave. If you take an outfit that is borderline acceptable and do something like put on a hat, this will for some reason tip that outfit over into completely unacceptable now causing the walkout. 90% of outfit combinations result in a disgusted reaction. It's completely insane. You might be thinking maybe Rika is just particularly snobbish and other characters are more lax, but no, every single girl in the game is like this. Why are you all like this? This is something you will constantly chafe against over the course of the game, and it's an example of how subtle mechanical malfunctions colour your perception of the characters. Because having to wrestle with the outfit selection every single date where your best case result in most cases is getting insulted, makes you think of all these girls as staggeringly rude assholes. Imagine you go out with someone and the first thing they tell you is that you look like shit because they don't like your t-shirt. I assure you this is comedically rude regardless of culture, this isn't one of those things that makes more sense from the Japanese perspective. Like, how are you going to be such a hard ass to me when you showed up in this goddamn chew candy looking ass fit? Fuck you. Upon giving up and settling for a disgusted reaction, but not a walkout from Rika, I continue the date to the museum as planned. Dates don't play out dramatically differently from previous entries. You go somewhere, the girl will make some kind of comment about what's happening. You'll be prompted for a response, pick the response she likes the most, date is a success. 
We do see some benefit from the 3D rendering style during these segments as characters have many more poses and outfits than in previous games. But it comes at a surprising cost to the game's pacing because characters cannot snap quickly between poses and sometimes the game hitches a bit and does this weird thing where characters animate between two or three poses before they answer for some reason. In general, conversations are less breezy as a result of the 3D rendering style. It's a subtle thing and you might not think it's a big deal, but it adds up significantly. Tokimemo 3 feels like it has less content than other games in this series, but takes longer to complete and this kind of thing is a huge part of why, along with the constant save scumming needed for stupid shit like the outfit system. A thing that was added to the second game and retained for 3 here is that after a date you will sometimes be prompted for a follow-up where you grab food with your date at a nearby diner where you can ask a few questions or pick some of the conversation topics you unlocked via the hobby system, which is where that whole system comes in handy. Here's the attempt to tie that back into the core character interactions. It's a noble effort, but very rarely do the characters actually have anything interesting to say in response to the hobby conversations. They largely only have generic reactions where they go, Eh, so nanda, if they kinda like it, or they just go, Eh, not my thing, if they're not. You can ask questions like what her hobbies are in an attempt to, you know, figure out what they're into in the first place, although in my experience playing this, half the cast are gamers, so investing all your free time into completing video games will give you a bevy of successful conversation topics. Take note, guys, if you go on dates and spend all of them talking about video games, it'll go great! I mean, I'm sure it has for some people, but this comes off as a bit overly pandering to the interests of the player base, you know? The most important thing you can ask for, however, is their phone number. At this juncture, asking for the phone number has a 100% success rate, and with that you can actually start to play the game at a vaguely normal pace. It just might take you several hours to get here is all. Since phone numbers are so important, this becomes a priority. You need to drop everything to get this done, lest you end up with a character developing a bomb and you're unable to call them to get it sorted out. So okay, get the date, get the phone number, right? No because you can only ask for the number on this little follow-up chat, and that doesn't happen on every day. In fact, on most of them, it won't. If you don't understand the criteria for what makes the follow-up happen, you're going to be just flailing about at random. Tokyo Memo 3 leaves far, far too much of itself up to chance. There are two ways to get the follow-up. One is wearing an outfit the girl likes. As previously established, this is nearly impossible to work out. I tried dozens of times and I couldn't even work out how to get by without a sassy comment, let alone a good reaction. The second and infinitely simpler method is to take a date to a location that's outside the city. There's no reason to think this specifically matters and you might catch on after enough playtime, but I think it's equally as likely for someone to just not make the connection. The menu does split areas by distance, but this comes with the curveball that more distant date spots seem to be more likely to get declined, so even knowing this you still can't escape the luck factor, even though knowing this requires you to get a lucky break exactly once rather than several times in a row. But with all that, we have obtained a phone number and this extremely frustrating tangent is now over and dealt with. Until you meet another girl. Then you get to do it all over again. Every time. Like I implied earlier, this is so important that when a new character is introduced, you will need to drop everything you're doing to get this done, which is yet another element of this game that causes the pace to crash to a screeching halt every time a new girl shows up. Fortunately, you only need to do this about likely four-ish times total across a playthrough. Unfortunately, this is because the cast size is so small that that is just the maximum number of phone numbers you can get. Cast your eyes back to that key art once more. This is it. This is the entire cast, minus the couple of secret characters who I'm going to brazenly discount because you're unlikely to activate those routes without advanced knowledge, so they're not a relevant consideration for a typical playthrough. We've got a total of six girls. Six. Compared to the 11 characters of 1 and 2, again not counting the secret characters, this is a really sad cast size and causes all kinds of problems with the base design of the game, but it also just means there's less chances for any given player to find a character they particularly resonate with. Variety is the spice of life after all. The core loop of Toki Memo, to reiterate from earlier, works by escalating difficulty as the game progresses by way of adding more girls to the mix as your stats increase and you cross more thresholds that cause you to meet said girls. Toki Memo 3 can't really do this as effectively because it has exactly one girl per stat and a reduced amount of stats to boot, so the game doesn't really get harder as it goes. Once you overcome the initial front-loaded confusing shitshow that is trying to figure out the silly ways they've reworked the system, you're probably good to handle the rest of it without much issue. Toki Memo 3 has a very bizarre difficulty balancing where it oscillates between very easy and intermittently very frustrating, largely because so much is left to chance. 
The reduced cast size also has the effect that repeat playthroughs are less interesting, because in 1 and 2 it is unlikely, albeit not impossible, for the player to meet all 11 characters on a typical playthrough, because the requirements for their appearance increase slightly when one is met, preventing the player from becoming overwhelmed too fast. Which means a subsequent playthrough can play out completely differently, because an entirely different selection of characters could end up appearing, including ones you didn't see on your first time through. In 3, it is very likely you will meet all four of the characters tied to a major stat every playthrough. There's nothing that'll really shake it up here. The only thing that might is grey hair over here, because you might have noticed four girls for four stats plus Yukiko doesn't add up to six, and that's because she exists outside the system. Her appearance condition is largely random, and sure, I guess that might mildly shake things up, but the last thing this game needed was yet another thing left completely up to chance. It's pretty likely for a typical playthrough to not meet her, so most of the time you're looking at only five characters total to interact with over a given run. Pretty thin pickings. So let's actually get back to my playthrough in specific. That might have seemed like a lot of broad picture analysis of the game, but it's pretty in line with how confusing the first five hours or so of the game is. For my playthrough I chose Yukiko as my desired ending, because she is the game's de facto protagonist and thus kind of the default Tokimemo 3 experience. Yukiko has roughly two identifiable hobbies and one personality trait, which is more than can be said for some characters, but it's still not great. She likes sweets, she likes video games, so far so good, and she is one jealous motherfucker. <laughs> Yukiko is the easiest character to complete the game with, and the main reason for this is Yukiko herself attempting to sabotage you if you attempt to pursue anyone else. Being a very frequent bomber on playthroughs where she is not the focus, and also becoming instantly upset if you attempt to ask her about how any of the girls feel. Because that's a thing now, probably in service to that realism angle once again, you can no longer just ring up one of your male friends and get a general readout on the game state, you have to ask a girl about what her friends think of you. This comes with the additional penalty beyond the opportunity cost of spending a holiday calling someone now, in that the girl you asked will dislike you slightly more for having asked in the first place, and if they have an active bomb, they will refuse this information and it might set off the bomb. It's a cruel joke that Yukiko is the only phone number you start the game with since she gets the most offended out of anyone if you ask her for this information, it's just better to not in most cases. This is again one of those mechanical quibbles where the implications may not have been fully considered, but it generally makes Yukiko come off as a possessive weirdo, and is one of the many reasons Yukiko is deeply unpopular even among the slim pickings of Tokimomo 3's cast. Furthermore, girls can only give you info about people they're friends with, which means you don't even get complete information from asking. Although, the pro strat here is to just save the game, ask Chitose because she's friends with almost everyone, take stock of the situation, and then just immediately load your save to no penalty. Makes the attempt to mix this mechanic up feel a bit pointless, it's more punishing to utilise, but also somehow less, because save scumming is so much easier now. As an aside, at about the halfway point of my playthrough I got tired and angry of needing to reload every date ten times to not get a disgusted reaction about my outfit, and I simply looked up how the hell you're meant to deal with this, and I'm gonna save you some time if you choose to play this yourself. This outfit. This is the one. This is the only outfit that elicits a favourable reaction from almost all of the game's cast. This and the business suit for some reason. I spent pretty much the entire game from this point on alternating these two outfits because they're the only two that seem to work. The system has no regard for location, so wearing a business suit to the beach is perfectly permissible. You just can't wear the same outfit too many times in a row, they decay in effectiveness over repeated use. Once again I reiterate, I am convinced this system cannot possibly be working right, this has to be broken somehow. Regardless, I press on with taking Yukiko on various dates in an attempt to finally touch on the character writing in this game, but my attempts are stymied by two things. Firstly, Yukiko's just kind of a nothing character, she has absolutely no spice. It's a little hard to demonstrate, but there's just nothing going on here. Secondly, there's been a broad reduction in the number of character-specific events that help to flesh out a character's personality and quirks in favour of an abundance of minigames, like this bowling minigame. Minigames featured in the previous games too, but 3 has much, much more of them, and none of them are amazing, which isn't surprising, they're just little diversions to break things up, there's nothing on face value wrong with that. But the fact they seem to have actively replaced the usual character events with stuff like this kind of shitty air hockey game where I won because the puck got stuck endlessly bouncing back and forth in the centre of the table is a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. I think the post-date chats and hobby system is intended to make up for this a little by giving you theoretically more options, but as discussed earlier, it doesn't really pan out that way. Tokimomo 3 has instead largely sectioned off all character-specific storytelling into a more conventional, visual novel-style route system, where once some threshold is crossed for character affection and stats, you'll end up on their route and will be treated to several scenes in sequence, possibly spread over a few in-game months involving them. There are pros and cons with this approach compared with the more spontaneous event-driven storytelling of previous games. Mostly cons, if you ask me. 
but in the interest of fairness, it does theoretically allow for the developers to craft a tighter narrative arc for the characters, when you can reliably predict in what order, and roughly how far apart the player is going to see a given set of scenes. The downsides are numerous, starting with the fact that it reduces the spontaneity of an individual playthrough. It feels a lot less like you're creating your own story, where the order of events witnessed or whether some are even seen at all is down to player decisions. Tokimo 3's style is significantly more linear, and it means a playthrough of any given character is likely to feel pretty similar between different people. The other major downside is the specific way it's been implemented. I said earlier that when you level up, you trigger an event. Story events like this are included in that, and in fact take priority over all else. If you activate a story event, you will not receive the walking home events until the story has run its course. This is one of the major reasons it's so important to get the phone number situation under control at the earliest opportunity. Because if you end up activating a character story while a different girl is slowly brewing a bomb, you will have no options because the story will take priority. Also, I said the advantage of this system is the predictable pace the designers can rely on to dole out the story, but even this isn't really true because events don't trigger at all during, say, summer vacation when school isn't in session. Which means if school breaks for the holidays in the middle of a story chain, then it just gets put on pause for a while, utterly killing the flow. A related flaw of tying the event progression to level ups is that if you go in very hard on leveling too early, it is quite possible to screw yourself by making it take ages to level when you do finally get onto a character out because obviously, it takes more time to level up the higher level you already are, ruining the pace. And it's very easy to level up quickly in this game, and unless you look it up ahead of time, you don't really know that the stat requirements for seeing endings is mostly not that demanding in this game. So if you play in a min-maxing way, it'll bite you here. Very frustrating. But all of this isn't necessarily a fatal problem if the storytelling is well done. So now we start getting to the meat and potatoes of why people did not like Tokimeki Memorial 3. Everything I've described so far might make the game sound dire, and yeah, make no mistake, all the mechanical problems outlined do make the game a pain in the ass to get your head around and severely impacts the pacing and general ease of play, but it can all be learned and adapted to. Spend enough time with it and your brain does just adjust to Tokimemo 3's bizarre pace. It's not like previous games, but there is an identifiable groove you can get into if you're willing to put in the effort to learning its bizarre machinations. What it will not save you from is the characters and the many ways in which they suck. So let's cover them all. Won't take long, there's not that many of them after all. Let's start with Yukiko, the ostensible heroine. Firstly, I want to note that I was about six hours into my playthrough before her story events even began, which is about two thirds of the way into a playthrough. It takes six hours before anything resembling character development starts, which is ridiculously slow. But eventually, Yukiko will offer to take you to a candy shop she likes, because sweets is one of her two hobbies. So you go there and you meet the elderly woman who runs the place, who instantly hates you for seemingly no reason. This is, if you haven't noticed by now, extremely on brand for Tokyo Memo 3. But Yukiko likes this old woman and hanging out here and insists she's actually very nice. You get a couple of events to the effect of old woman hates you, but eventually the woman falls ill. Okay, now put a pin in that because instead we're going to complete Rika's story first. That might seem like an odd choice, but it's what happened to me during my playthrough. Due to Rika bombing every other week after the midpoint of the game, Rika's story completely interrupted this particular event chain and took priority. I was actually worried I was going to get the wrong ending because of this, even though I had made no particular effort to interact with anyone besides Yukiko. Rika kind of forced her way in here. So Rika is... the energetic type. I can't figure out how else to describe her personality other than she doesn't talk so much as she yells all her lines at you. She is into science because her name is literally science, we went over this, but this manifests in her electrocuting the protagonist for data over the course of her story, since pointless cruelty is a staple of this game. Goofy cartoon slapstick does occur from time to time in this series, but 3's tone just doesn't land. It comes off as far more mean-spirited than I think it intends to, and this is very apparent in Rika's story. It transpires the region sees inflicting this on the protagonist is for the sake of her attempts to create a robot dog, which contrasts strangely with how she seems afraid of an actual dog that's taken a liking to her earlier in the story. The big twist of this plotline is that her desire to create a robot dog is revealed to be the result of a past trauma, as Rika's beloved childhood dog passed away after she tried to cure it of a cold by injecting it with energy drinks. She killed a dog by injecting it with Red Bull. This is supposed to be an endearing character moment somehow. I cannot stress enough, I didn't make that up. That's really what they go with here. She killed a dog, so she wants to create a dog that can't die because killing the dog messed her up. I know kids do really stupid things because they don't understand the world, like I once screwed up a PlayStation's disk drive because if you play Tekken 3 and you don't have a second controller plugged in, the UI says insert coin because it's an arcade port. 
But silly younger Punchy took that as a command and was like, yeah, no, insert coin, that sounds reasonable. And it turns out PlayStations don't like having coins in them, who would have guessed? But I wouldn't say this kind of goof is on par with trying to inject a dog with Monster Ultra, you know? What's especially funny is that at the moment this is all laid out, your protagonist has nothing to say. Them apparently being just as weirded out by all of this as I was, the scene just sort of awkwardly phase out and we cut back to the regular gameplay. But only very briefly, because this arc is shortly resolved by the final scene where Rika shoes away the same real dog from earlier, directly into the path of oncoming traffic. But Robodog intervenes before Rika can increase her dog kill count even further and sacrifices itself to save the real dog which causes Rika to have an epiphany about the value of organic life or something. I'm not clear on what it is about this experience that causes her to get over her hangless, but she subsequently adopts the real dog into her life and, by way of metaphor, has opened her heart up to caring about real people. Or maybe she just realised machines are no less susceptible to blunt force trauma than people are, who knows. The conclusion of this arc really doesn't land at all, and the entire thing floored me with how insane it is. Rika is a psychopath and a serial dog murderer. Next girl. Next up to bat is Emi Tachibana, a polite but formal type who has probably the most non-hostile introduction in the game because you simply end up meeting her while out for a morning jog. She's into the extremely traditionally Japanese things like calligraphy and ikebana. It's a kind of flower arranging art form. But also Aikido! Hell yeah, Emi can throw hands. Well, throw people since Aikido is mostly a grappling art, as whatever. Alas, since Tokimemo 3 is what it is, her route has her experiencing a severe medical complication that pulls her away from Aikido for a few months, during which time the Aikido club completely collapses in the absence of their ace, because none of the other members really cared about the sport. So she gets extremely depressed about it and it's up to the protagonist to pull her out of this slump. Now, this is a bit less insane than the dog murder interlude, but it does highlight one of the major issues of Tokimemo 3, which is that nothing nice seems to happen to any of the characters, ever. Every single plotline is like this, some tragedy either has befallen or will befall the characters over the course of it, and will become depressed as a result. The game is just a constant misery parade which makes it exhausting and uncomfortable, but also sort of darkly hilarious because everyone in Moegino's lives just sucks so much. Like, how can so many girls be so unfortunate? For instance, one of the secret characters, who I unfortunately lack footage of because you have to just stumble onto her randomly, naturally, is a terminally ill student who can just flat out die by succumbing to her illness if you make the wrong choices after making contact with her. Nothing nice ever happens in Moegino. For a series with up to this point such vibrant and carefree energy, it's hard to understand what compelled the team to make the decision to have the third entry be such a sad display. I can't say for certain, but I suspect the answer lies with Kaori Yae from the second game, who, in short, had her own arc about dealing with depression, but crucially she's the only character like that in 2, and 2 in general is much more adept at tone juggling. The developers have been quoted in interviews as saying that Yae was a risk as a character, but their gamble paid off and Yae's arc highly resonated with the player base, resulting in her becoming one of the most popular characters, second only to the game's main heroine. It seems the team's takeaway from that was people like sad girls, and they dial it up to an absurd extreme in 3, which results in a game that is itself depressing. Let's make these next two quick. There's Odamari, whose name is phonetic with shut up in Japanese, yes, really. She lives up to her namesake immediately because she is the snooty aloof type who brazenly insults the player and tells them to piss off in basically all of their interactions. I think her baggage is that she's under pressure to become an actress because her parents are famous and she eventually breaks down under the stress and becomes depressed because they all do. She is thoroughly awful and unlikable the whole game so I did not care. Towards the end of my playthrough she inexplicably called out of the blue to invite me to watch her participate in an acting contest which I found very peculiar given she spent the entire playthrough being rude and seemingly wanting nothing to do with me, but nevertheless I went and was delighted when she lost. That was the last I saw of her on that run. Goodbye Mari. Enter Shinjo Serika, who I barely have any footage of owing to her random appearance criteria. She's a different kind of aloof loner type who will not infrequently stand you up on dates and not really offer a good explanation for this, which, much like a lot of things in this game, makes her seem like kind of a dick. But her deal turns out to be that her parents were kidnapped by the government as leverage against her because she is supernaturally gifted and fights demons across Japan at night. Which, okay, as far as the sad sacks of this game's cast go, that's kind of metal, but it's also completely stolen from canon, so I'm not sure I can award any points for it. Save the best for almost last, we have Chitose Aizawa, Yukiko's bestie and probably my favourite character. She does, however, introduce herself in a very Tokimemo 3-esque way by openly messing with the player character. Can I ask you some questions? <laughs> ha 
Have you ever been to foreign country? Okay, in my experience, when a Japanese person asks about foreign country, they really just mean America. You'd be amazed. I've been asked like twice something like, is it true foreigners wear their shoes indoors? And I'm like, not in fucking England we don't. That's an American thing. It's different. They're different places. It is so uniquely cursed to be a Brit who can speak Japanese because the Americans ask you about Japan and the Japanese ask you about America like you're an authority on either. And oh my God, why are you- Yes, I've been to America. Whatever. She later follows this up with... The first noise I'm done. Meaning your zipper is open and you can react accordingly embarrassed or reply with incorrect English. This introduction is, to me, an example of how Tokimeki Memorial 3 hasn't completely lost the source. It can still sometimes be funny on purpose and make a decent impression with a character from the get-go. Aizawa does still sometimes lapse into the weird Tokimemo 3 tendency for characters to just be astoundingly mean to you for seemingly no reason, but her more openly mischievous demeanor helps to make it come off not quite as maliciously as it tends to for the rest of the cast. Aizawa also benefits from probably having the most normal baggage of the game's cast, she aspires to study abroad, sharpen up her English skills, and so on, but has reservations about following through on her dream. Her life and her friends are in Japan, after all. So as she grows fonder of the player character, she turns to him to ask for guidance, and in fact, the ultimate conclusion of how, or indeed if, she follows through on her ambition is actually down to how you play it. Which is surprisingly uncommon for the core story events in this game, given that sort of thing is like, the entire appeal of life simulator games? But anyway, Aizawa's story stands out for being grounded and maybe even relatable compared to the constant misery parade that is the rest of Tokyo Memo 3. I still don't think she's as strong as most of 2's cast, mainly due to how 3's mechanics interfere with storytelling, but also because there's something of a dropped ball in how it comes up occasionally that Aizawa has a tense relationship with her dad for reasons that are never quite made clear. That plotline never really manages to successfully come into focus, so it ends up feeling like a missed opportunity. Regardless, I'd still say she manages to be better than several characters from the first game, so gold star, Aizawa, you did it. You're the most salvageable thing about this mess of a game. And finally, we circle back to Yukiko, who I abandoned partway through her arc because that is how my playthrough panned out. Sorry about that, Yukiko, what were you saying? Oh, the candy shop woman died. Right, yes, we're back to the misery parade. The candy shop woman that Yukiko liked hanging out with falls ill and thus dies. Nothing nice happens in Moegino. Yukiko, not unreasonably, gets upset about this and stops showing up to school. You need to intuit at this point that you should phone Yukiko to check in on her and offer her some pep talk. This is actually how all depressive episodes in this game work mechanically. Two thirds of the cast go through it at some point, and I will note that the way this is implemented means it is possible for an ill-timed espresso depresso can actually brick your playthrough. The timing of these is not fixed, so if they happen to occur at a time where you can't make a phone call, like say, the school trip that happens in the second year, you're screwed and you're going to miss the timing and the game will likely drop you off the route. Rotating saves isn't anything new to seasoned RPG players, but it's especially important to keep saves going back a few months of game time as you play through Toki Memo 3 because of goofy things like that, where poorly considered mechanical interactions can waste an entire 12 hour playthrough. I was both fortunate and unfortunate in that I didn't get any of these events to trigger until very late into the playthrough, fortunate in the sense that I wasn't able to miss any from poor timing, unfortunate in that large portions of this run were spent doing basically nothing interesting as a result. At any rate, we call Yukiko, she tells us that she's still upset and needs more time, but she appreciates us calling. Completely reasonable reaction, not gonna knock that. More time, as it turns out, meant less than 24 hours because she turns up at school the next day having now completely gotten over it. What? That was sudden. All depressive episodes in this game are like that, you throw them a phone call and they just instantly snap out of it, so it doesn't even really do justice to the gravitas of its subject matter, somehow managing to both be too serious and not serious enough at the same time. There's kind of an awkward pause in the narrative at this point where you're going through the stat raising motions and you might genuinely be led to believe this is just where this arc aborts, but no. It eventually comes to Yukiko's attention that the old woman left her a letter with instructions to read it alongside you, the player. So you make the trip to her grave to do so, and in the letter the old lady recounts a story from her youth where she invited a boy she liked out to the legendary hill but ultimately was unable to confess her feelings for him, and her beloved would ultimately never return, dying in what I think is implied to be World War II leaving her to stew in regret for the rest of her days. Once again, nothing nice happens in Moegino. She implores Yukiko not to make the same mistake and says she'll be watching over her. We then immediately awkwardly cut back to the protagonist's bedroom, even though this really seems like the kind of thing that would invite some kind of discussion between the protagonist and Yukiko, who I remind you are standing next to each other in this scene. But because of the way they've paced this plotline, this isn't the actual ending, that's not until graduation day, so they just kind of have to awkwardly move on without comment and have you play out the remainder of the game, even though this really seems like the kind of thing that would fit an ending. Furthermore, sure, very valiant effort on the game's part to be moving, but maybe you're noticing a major problem with Yukiko's route? 
that it's not actually about Yukiko. We've learned significantly more about a now-deceased old woman than we have about the game's ostensible main heroine, who has remained basically a void of charisma from start to finish. Compared to Two's lead, who gets hours of entertaining and endearing character development, Yukiko is amazingly hollow by comparison. Graduation day rolls around and things play out in a fairly predictable way. We receive a letter in our desk inviting us to the legendary hill. We rush there and indeed, Yukiko is waiting for us. She confesses her love for us and astoundingly at this point we are given the option to just reject her outright. There's no real point to doing this, you just get the bad ending, but it is really funny the game even allows that. It was very tempting to indulge it, but I did actually want a real ending, so I accepted Yukiko's feelings. And they lived happily ever after. Aww. So that was Tokimeki Memorial 3, an absolute hot mess of a video game as I'm sure you have very much understood by now. Now, to be clear, despite all of this, Toki Memo 3 is far from the worst video game I've ever played in my life. It's not completely devoid of the juice that makes this series fun to play in places, but many odd decisions that don't coalesce, a cast almost completely devoid of any likeable characters, and many mechanics that don't even seem to be working right, results in a game that is absolutely exhausting to get through. It's not the worst game I've ever played, but it is certainly among the worst dating sims I've played, and one of the sharpest declines in quality I've ever seen in a series in successive installments. We're talking like Devil May Cry 1 to 2 kind of drop here, guys. And indeed, it is a drop that the surrounding genre would never really recover from. Mainline Tokimeki Memorial would go dormant after this game for an extremely long period of time, and while the spin-off girl side games produced alongside 3 would be a minor hit for Konami would keep the series alive in some form for just a little while longer, but the big budget console dating sim would largely stop existing after the PS2. The poor performance of Tokimeki Memorial 3, and to a lesser extent True Love Story 3, signalling an end to the genre boom and the lack of faith players had in it at the time. The dating sim would shift form to survive, largely becoming a genre that lived instead on handhelds like the DS and PSP for a time, but this too would eventually dry up. Tokimeki Memorial would see one last mainline installment in 4, released for the PSP in 2009, and this game, despite being quite good, was not a comeback for the series. In fact, having actually played it, the tone of it is quite sentimental. It becomes clear in context that Tokimemo 4 was not intended as a revival, it was a send-off. One last final farewell and thanks for all the good times before bowing out. And it is very interesting for that sentimentality. It is a game that's perfectly enjoyable as a standalone experience, it makes a lot of smart changes to the formula, and is a return to form for likeable characters who don't all treat you like shit right off the bat. But the experience is definitely enhanced by playing it with the relevant context in mind. And well, that's what the past hour and 15 minutes of this video has been. That's the context. They knew this game was going to mark the end of mainline Tokimeki Memorial, and they ran with it. I'm currently writing this in 2024, where no dedicated handheld devices exist due to the Switch bringing bigger console games to the handheld space, resulting in the general extinction of that whole strata of mid-budget game development, and the dating sim along with it. That might be a bit of a controversial assessment of the Switch to just throw out there, but I don't really have time to get into it, this video is already insanely long. That gets us to the current day, where the dating sim is by and large a completely dead genre. Now, I would be remiss not to mention that Konami recently announced a remake of the first Toki Memo, a thing that definitely didn't happen while I was editing this, forcing me to rewrite this part of the script to accommodate it. Nope! That would be really annoying, so I'm glad that isn't what happened. Regardless, similar to Toki Memo 4, in my currently speculative opinion, I doubt this marks a great comeback for the genre or anything. In general, this modern age of remakes and remasters, I can count on one hand the number of series that actually got full-scale new entries off the back of financially successful remakes. Cynically, this is a cash-in on a recognisable name, and uncynically, it's a nice way to preserve the original game that started a phenomenon. I mean, hell, I'm gonna buy it, but Konami being what they are nowadays, I don't really expect this to dramatically change the outlook for the genre at large. I don't even think it's very likely to get an English translation, but if we're ever going to get one, now would be the time, so... Here's hoping. Perhaps my viewpoint strikes you as a bit pessimistic, but I'll hold to that for now, as the current outlook for the genre still remains about as bleak as ever. But I had to mention the remake or I was absolutely going to get comments about it. So from where we stand now, the question becomes, is Tokimeki Memorial 3 really to blame? Well... Yes and no. No single game, no matter how profoundly bad, could truly be responsible for killing an entire genre, and I'm sorry for clickbaiting you. If you made it this far and are upset by my ruse, I am truly sorry. But in a sense, yes. We can't see the road not taken, but Tokimemo 3 was definitely responsible for a broad loss of confidence in the genre and its own series among publishers and players. 
Had Tokimemo 3 had more time to bake and come out a stronger product, it's completely possible it could have at least been a modest hit and kept the genre viable for at least one more console generation. It could maybe have survived long enough for them to test the waters with translating for an international market. Who knows how it could have shaken out. I think in a highly idealistic best case scenario, there is a timeline where things could have worked out. Now, in my speculative assessment, I think the pressures of HD development bearing down would likely have eventually forced the genre down the path it did regardless, but had Tokimemo 3 not imploded the way it did, it might not have met such a sudden and ignoble end. The patient was most likely terminal, but 3 didn't catch the memo that it's still considered generally impolite to stab the terminally ill. And it is a shame the story has the ending it does, particularly because this genre largely died before it ever really managed to make it out of Japan. I suspect a large part of the reason the genre phased out beyond all the above mentioned reasoned is the game market becoming increasingly globalized during the seventh generation of consoles, and the dating sim never managed a viable test case for international releases, with almost all of the well-liked examples of games in the genre being untranslated Japanese domestic releases. Companies obviously prefer to invest time developing something they can sell to more people, after all. The story of the dating sim is by and large the same story a lot of interesting games released during the PS1 days experienced being forced out of existence by the rising cost of development stymieing genre experiments like the original Tokimeki Memorial. Not to drop this video into extremely boomer, modern game bad kind of talk, but I do think it's pretty readily observable that we see significantly less genre variety out of modern AAA game development compared to the more experimental and wild days of the PS1 and PS2. And the dating sim is by and large a victim of this, even if Tokimemo 3 forced it into an earlier grave than it likely deserved. Nowadays, indie games have risen up to pick up the slack and fill the gap that big-budget game development left behind, but the dating sim hasn't managed to be one of those genres. Partly because indie devs make games inspired by things they like, and there aren't exactly many indies inspired by Tokimeki Memorial 2. Western literacy regarding the genre remains extremely poor even to this day, we largely never had a chance with all the best games being untranslated and all. In Western discourse, people still have a habit of using dating sim and visual novel interchangeably, even though they're really not, which is why I had to spend the first entire 10 minutes of this video explaining what kind of game I was even talking about, and I'm willing to bet people are still going to get confused about this in the comments, I don't expect this video to solve this particular problem. The genre is still regarded as a joke, where even the relatively sincere attempts seem to think they have to start from some kind of quirky premise because despite best efforts they just can't shake off the idea, mainly because Hatofu Boyfriend seems to have broken everyone's brains. Probably the only sincere and not joke premise indie dating sims I've played are the pair of Magical Diary games. It's slim pickings out here, man. And it's weird to me that this is a space left unfilled. Everyone seems to love romance in their Bald Man's Gate 3 and their Stone Dew Valleys or whatever. It's not that Westerners are chronically unable to comprehend romance in video games, just for some reason you have to Trojan horse it into a bigger RPG or a farming simulator, like putting medicine in dog food so they don't notice. Romance is perhaps the most common genre of media in general the world over, in basically every medium except video games for some reason. The time is ripe for someone to take a big swing here, I think. It's a market that's been untapped since the 90s, and I don't think anything about these games' appeal is impossible for a modern audience to understand. There's very much a reason at their peak they were a cultural phenomenon in their native Japan, and I hope in time, someone will thread the needle and convince everyone of what they've been missing all this time. As for Tokimeki Memorial itself, the mainline series has remained dead since 2009, with 4 being the last installment. And with Konami itself these days being what Konami is, it seems extremely unlikely that they'll be the ones to spearhead a comeback. Tokimemo 3 might have been an unmitigated disaster, but the series still produced three exceptional games. One genre trailblazer, one Stone Cold Classic, and one Last Hurrah. That's a better batting average than a lot of series could claim to have, so as far as I see it, it is indeed better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all.